everyone, it's Jacob here, and today we're talking about something that is as American as apple pie. A true story of coming up from nothing and creating something that would change the world. Of course, I'm talking about the Transcontinental Telegraph. Let's go take a look. Our story begins back in 1825, but not quite where you'd expect. We first have to go to Britain where physicist William Sturgeon was pioneering experiments into electromagnetic technology. However, his experiments weren't really capturing the attention of anyone of the day, and it wasn't until Sir Charles Wheatstone stepped in and developed an apparatus of several wires, about 26 to be exact, with each wire corresponding to a single letter of the alphabet that any sort of communication was ever attempted. It was a very clunky apparatus, and in no way would it ever be feasible long-distance communication. But American painter Samuel F. B. Morse was traveling in France at about this time and he heard about these experiments. Now, now painter is kind of an interesting title for the guy because yes he painted some things but he was also very wealthy and a big inventor. Loved to tinker with things. So he was enthralled by this idea and on the ship home he could do nothing but sketch little diagrams and prototype drawings of what he wanted to do. It was here where Americans began to step in and the American ingenuity began to take over. He first started off with only a single battery cell and a relatively standard magnet, which worked okay. He could send pulses, but not over a whole lot of wire. His saving grace was his colleague, Leonard Gale, who saw him struggling with this technology and said, hey, why don't you use instead of just one battery, 20 batteries? Instead of that regular magnet, use a really powerful magnet. This meant hundreds of yards of wire could be covered by just a single apparatus. Thus, we now had a viable technology and could eventually start to petition Congress. Now, Congress was rather skeptical at the time. It seemed like a very far-fetched idea to send messages over long distances in a short amount of time, particularly with a new technology like electricity. It wasn't until Hiram Sibley stepped in, a man who was very wealthy and had a lot of influence on Capitol Hill, that governmental appropriation was given to Morse to build a line from the basement of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland. This occurred in March of 1843. And in May of 1844, the very first message was sent across a telegraph. It said, What hath God wrought? Well, Congress didn't know the answer to that question because they didn't actually facilitate any structure of building more telegraphs. Any business who really wanted to could build a line. And thus, in a very short amount of time, over 12,000 miles of telegraph crisscrossed the East. Enter Edward Creighton. The son of an Irish immigrant in Ohio, he started his own business, just carting things around. That's basically all he did. And during one of these trips, he came across some men putting up telegraph poles. Quickly, he got a contract to cart telegraph poles to all the sites across the East Coast. This, of course, led to him eventually being on the cruise, putting up the poles, to finally being the superintendent of many construction operations across the East Coast. And he got his younger brother, John, to tag along sometimes, too. Eventually, he got noticed by Hiram Sibley and Ezra Cornell. Each one of those men had owned his own telegraph business, one of the dozens that were popping up all over the place. So to protect their investment, they merged together to form one big company. Can you guess what they decided to call their company? Yep, Western Union. The extra profits from this allowed them to buy up even more companies until eventually they had monopolized the entire East Coast. By 1856, they were making plans to start building a telegraph across the country. But first, they're going to need some government support. You see, they didn't want to fund this sort of venture all on their own. It's very expensive and would need a lot of workers to get it done. So Hiram Sibley began to lobby Congress once again, just as he did back to help Samuel Morse in the 1840s. While they were waiting around for the contracts to come in from the government, both of the Creighton brothers moved to Omaha where they began to establish themselves as prominent members of the community. Edward partnered up with the Kuntz brothers and founded the First National Bank of Omaha, as well as another bank in Butte, Montana. John 
was a primary shareholder in the Omaha Stockyards Company and was served as president for several years. So they were basically just kind of doing very well for themselves here in Omaha when finally, in July of 1860, Congress passed the Pacific Telegraph Act, which allocated $40,000 per year to any company willing to build a telegraph across the country. Right away, Western Union got mobilized. They sent an associate named Jephthah Wade to San Francisco to begin negotiations with some of the telegraph companies in the West Coast. The goal was to get them to start building east. While that was going on, Edward was tasked with building a line from Omaha to Fort Kearney. Once he reached Fort Kearney, they didn't really have a plan of where they were going to go next. So Hiram Sibley told Edward to start riding a horse over the Rocky Mountains to San Francisco. Now, this was about December of 1860. You don't want to go over the Rocky Mountains in December. Bad idea. But he went alone, on horseback, and wound up in Salt Lake City pretty much half dead, where Brigham Young and the Mormons nursed him back to health, and even agreed to help build the telegraph. They would go and cut down trees to make poles for the lines, which was crucial when developing lines in the treeless plains east of the Rocky Mountains and also across some of the deserts by the Sierra Nevada mountains. Finally, in early of 1861, Edward made it to San Francisco, where he met up with Jeff the Wade and finished the negotiations. The Western Telegraph Companies agreed to consolidate to form the Overland Telegraph Company. They would start building from Sacramento and go all the way to Salt Lake City. Meanwhile, Edward would start a line from Fort Kearney where he had left off and travel the way he had ridden on horseback to meet up with them there. This all began July 2nd of 1861, and by October 24th of that same year, the Chief Justice of California, Stephen Field, was able to send a telegraph from his home office to President Abraham Lincoln, informing him of the success of the line and of California's commitment to supporting the Union. The impact of the telegraph is incredible. First of all, if you look at the time period when it was completed, it was right in the middle of the Civil War, a time when our country was more divided than it has ever been. And yet, we managed to build a symbol of connectedness, of unity. East and West were no longer separated by the Great American Desert. California was more a part of the Union than ever before. The Telegraph also gave rise to the National Corporation. Thanks to the Telegraph, companies could communicate with their businesses in different cities all over the country in a matter of minutes, which revolutionized the way people did business. Can you imagine trying to have a company like Carnegie Steel or Standard Oil when they have to take a couple days to let other people in different parts of the country know about corporate changes? No. Thanks to the Telegraph, we were able to see a rise in those big businesses, for better or for worse. There are many modern parallels to the current age of the Internet. We now know what's going on all over the world, all at once. We're all connected, faster and more efficiently than ever before. Telegraph, one could say, was the beginning of instantaneous communication. Rather than have to wait a period of days to hear from another coast, it would just take a matter of minutes to send a message. The Telegraph also revolutionized the way we feel about wars. As stated previously, it got finished in the middle of the Civil War, which meant reporters could give stories directly from the front lines to their editors. It also changed the way reporters told stories as well because there was always a risk that the telegraph line could get cut in the middle of a transmission. So to make sure the story was still able to get published, reporters would put all the pertinent information in the first paragraph, and each subsequent paragraph would be less and less important. That way, if they lost the end of the message, the story could still go out. If you look at a modern newspaper, you'll see some of the same style of reporting even today. Without a doubt, the Telegraph is uniquely American. Born in the workshop of an entrepreneurial inventor, it spread across the continent on the backs of immigrant labor, revolutionizing the way people live and work. The truest symbol of American ideals and expansion, the Telegraph sparked greater communication and union. 
ultimately allowing the events of the late 19th century to even occur. Through the Western Union, America became a more whole union. By its spark, the flame of progress was inextinguishably lit. So that about does it for this presentation on the Transcontinental Telegraph. Now you guys basically know all there is. Um, you know, I didn't leave anything out at all. It, it was perfect. Um, so yeah, thanks all for watching.